$1.2 billion of exposure to digital assets was traded on DYDX yesterday. The decentralized perpetual futures trading platform has grown to become the market leader in its niche. But are trading volumes really an indication that it might be ready to take on Binance and FTX? Is the user experience really that competitive given the restrictions of decentralization? This is what I aim to find out when exploring the rise of DYDX. Good morning, my name is James Pacini. On this channel, I explore new and emerging DeFi technologies. I'm not a financial advisor, this is not financial advice. DYDX is a margin trading platform. It lets traders take out leveraged bets on the price of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Outcoin. It's going to go up or down relative to the US dollar. If you've ever used an exchange like Binance or FTX or BitMEX to trade perpetual futures contracts, and this works in a very similar way. The main key difference is that it's decentralized. So a trader would deposit funds from the Ethereum mainnet into a smart contract, which is like a non-custodial store of those funds. And then you're actually trading on a layer two scaling solution called Starkware. So the transaction confirmation is almost instant and you don't have the same gas fees you get on the Ethereum mainnet. And this is critical because DYDX uses an order book. In contrast to something like Uniswap, where you're trading into a liquidity pool, DYDX uses an order book similar to centralized exchanges where you have the bid prices and the ask prices. And as a trader, you can even put in a limit price. So you'd say, I'd buy Bitcoin if the price drops to this price, or I'd sell it if it gets up to this price, or you can execute a market order, which takes the best possible price for the volume that you're trading. Perpetual futures contracts have been extremely popular since BitMEX introduced them in 2016. They're now traded at higher volumes than the underlying spot assets. That means that there's more people buying the perpetual futures contract for Bitcoin than there is actually buying Bitcoin itself. And this is quite normal and expected. In traditional markets, futures contracts tend to trade considerably higher than the underlying assets that they represent. But back to DYDX. They've seen some traction as well, and they've traded over $370 billion of these perpetual futures contracts since their launch. I think it's worth noting that the trading volume needs to be taken with a pinch of salt because a lot of it is coming from incentivized trading. They're distributing the DYDX token to users of the platform based on their trading volumes. So for market makers that are already working in this space, there's an incentive there to use the platform to gain the DYDX token. And they can make profits that way even if their trading isn't profitable. But having said that, so much of the growth in DeFi is incentivized by the distribution of governance tokens that it would make sense that the leading trading platform would do the same thing. DYDX has faced some criticism regarding its levels of decentralization, both from a governance and a tech perspective. I think the governance is likely to sort itself out. There's a roadmap in place already with plans to further decentralize towards a kind of decentralized autonomous organization later this year. I think the regulatory risk of having a product which is built around decentralized leveraged trading products makes this a smart move. And while the exchange itself is already kind of blocked in America, everyone knows that you can just use a VPN to get around that. So there's still going to be some American users on there. And the SEC is kind of, it's looking for a reason to target someone like this and make an example of them. So I think the more decentralized they become, the better it is for all the stakeholders in the project. The tech is slightly more complicated, and to understand this, we really need to understand how Starkware works. So Starkware is a ZK roll-up, or a ZK Stark, hence the name. And what it does is it bundles all the transactions together, so throughout a set period of time, all the transactions that go through on a trading platform will be bundled together, and then that single transaction will be put into Ethereum mainnet. So rather than every trader paying a gas fee every time they want to put a limit order into the order book, all them transactions will be bundled together, They'll actually sign it to prove that it's come from their account. That will go through to a almost private network of nodes. That will do the computation and it will upload a proof to Ethereum mainnet. So Ethereum is still providing the security, but we've got this kind of almost private blockchain, which is providing the computational power to process these transactions. Is it perfect? Well, no, it's probably not as decentralized as everyone would like. But given the technology that's available currently, I think it's probably the best option for them as they want to launch their product and have it working right now. This time next year, we'll see the second part of the migration to Ethereum 2.0, which will be the Surge update, which introduces data sharding, and also some other improvements that will make ZK rollups a lot more efficient, a lot more feasible to run in this more decentralized manner. So if DYDX is going to take on Binance and FTX and the big players in the industry, I think one of the critical things is that its user experience has got to be at least as good as them centralized exchanges. So you can actually test this yourself and I'm going to show you how now. So if we go to DYDX.exchange, we go to trade. We can switch the mainnet here to a testnet. 
And we can try this out to get a feel for what kind of level the user experience is here compared to centralized exchanges. On a test net, the funds are playing money, so there's no real risk. Let's go ahead and connect the wallet. And we're using MetaMask. We've got an error message here because we need to change the network from Ethereum mainnet down to Ropsten test network. Once that's set, we can now verify our ownership and enable trading. We're going to do this by signing a couple of transactions. There's the option to put in a username and email, which I don't want to do, so I'm just going to create the account. So I've been given $2,000 USDC to play with. So I've got my first deposit there of $2,000, my portfolio value is $2,000, and I can go ahead and start trading. If we have a look at the markets first, we can see we've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Chainlink, Curve. Got a lot of different assets here. I think there's 28 in total. So let's go ahead and try making a trade. Let's put in a limit order first. I'm gonna set the price to 2763. Note that the price of one ether is actually more than their clatter in my account. So I'm actually gonna be using 1.39X leverage to make this trade. Let's just update that price quickly to a competitive price and put that through. We've got an order in a book. Now, if the price moves away from my order, then my position won't get filled because I'm using a limit order here. If I wanted to get a transaction through faster, I could actually use a market order. So let's show you how to do this now. And a market order takes liquidity from order books. So we're essentially putting a trade through at this lowest ask price here. You tend to pay higher transaction fees for taking liquidity from order book than you do from placing limit orders and adding liquidity to the order book. And you see here we've got a taker fee of $1.38. So let's go ahead and place that market order because my limit order hasn't been filled. And that should be filled instantly. So we can see we've got a fill here where that order's gone through, the price it's gone through at. And our, we should have a position now of 1.39x leverage long on Ethereum. If the price drops below our limit order, then we're going to buy another one as well because we've already put a limit order in for that price. So now that limit order has gone through, we've now got a 2.78 leverage long. We've got a liquidation price of 1,822. And one of the really big issues with decentralized trading platforms is the liquidation price that you're gonna get on a position is generally much higher than it would be on other exchanges or centralized exchanges. I tested this earlier using a 10X leverage long on a uni governance token. The execution price on both DYDX and FTX was 4.44, $4.44. The liquidation price on DYDX was 420 and liquidation price on FTX was 4.12 or $4.12. So it's quite a big gap there. So you're getting liquidated earlier potentially, although you're also relying on third parties coming and do that liquidation. As you can see, my market time has been horrendous here and I've now lost $12 of testnet funds. Every little hurts. So let's go ahead and close this position. We can either close it with a market order here which will close the entire amount. Or the other option is we can just sell the assets back into the market. So we can put a limit order in at the lead and ask price for the same amount that we purchased them for. This is our order in the order book and that's just waiting to be filled. Obviously when you're looking at something like this and you see a lot of volume going through and the order books look really kind of, like there's a lot of liquidity and then when you place an order, it kind of disrupts that flow and your order just sits there and doesn't get filled. It does look like wash trading, but bear in mind that this is the test net and that's the reason for that. So there we go, we've been filled on that now. Our position has been closed. If we go into our portfolio, we'll see that reflected in our account balance. So our new account balance from $2,000 has now gone down to 1982. Obviously when you're using leverage and margin trading products, you am fine both your profits and your losses and that's something that doesn't work well generally for discretionary traders. Let's talk a little bit about the DYDX token, distribution of which is going to look like this in 10 years time. So we have 22.7% going as trading rewards. And this is what we talked about earlier with incentivized trading, which is bringing a lot of volume onto the platform. There's a 20% team allocation and 25% going to investors. This is logged for 18 months from August 3rd, 2021 at 3 p.m. UTC. That means that this time next year, 30% of the tokens are going to become available on a single day. And then after that, the following six months, we're going to see another 40% distributed linearly, and then the rest are distributed over the next three years. There's a current circulating supply of just over 65 million, with a max supply of 1 billion. 
So there's a lot of tokens that kind of become available. There's also worth noting that in the documentation, it mentions that that max supply might be adjusted in the future with a 2% inflation rate ongoing. For me, what's interesting is the redirection of trading fees from the trading platform to the governance token holders. If the holders of the DYDX token receive the trading fees from the platform and that platform goes on to overtake Binance and FTX to become the number one place to go to trade digital assets, then that's obviously going to be a very valuable digital asset. It's been suggested that later this year we're going to see some updates to the governance and the tokenomics, which will make it clearer as to how this is going to work. It's clear that DYDX has become the market leader in its niche. The issue is that that niche is still relatively small compared to the crypto industry as a whole. We haven't seen the mainstream adoption that we're expecting in decentralized margin trading platforms. It makes sense to me that eventually the trading of digital assets and in governance token of decentralized projects will move to a decentralized platform. But we're just not seeing that yet. We're still very early and the technology is only really starting to evolve to a point where we can have high performance decentralized applications. There's an opportunity for developers here, whereas this time next year we're going to see the surge rollout on Ethereum 2.0, and that's going to enable data sharding and more efficient ZK rollups, which might bring the technology a step forward to enabling this. I think there's a fair chance that that platform grows out of what DYDX currently is, and I think with the, the first mover advantage and the growing moat that they've got and the backing from VCs, that they could eventually find a product which gives them product market fit and I'll see a flood of users kind of migrate to the platform the same way FDX did a couple of years ago. I hope you found this exploration of DYDX interesting. Please hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm. If you're interested in staying up to date with the latest emerging DeFi technologies, then subscribe to the channel. And thank you for watching to the end.